everyone. This is Freya Alamifar, or Dr. Freya Alamifar. She is the CEO of a computer vision platform called Pediametrics. Hi, everyone, and thanks for having me here. I'm Freya, founder and CEO of Pediametrics. Our mission is to transform pediatric healthcare using computer vision and AI. Right now, Pediametrics is about 20 people. We have a product in the market called SoftSpot that is the first and only software as a medical device that has been cleared by the FDA for scanning baby's skull. What made you take the dive into becoming a startup owner? My PhD field was medical imaging and robotics. And during my PhD studies, I also spent some time at the Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C., as well as in the National Institutes of Health. So I wanted to make the research I was doing in my PhD more useful. I wanted to see the impact of it in people's lives, and I wanted my career to have a purposeful meaning. And that's, I think, what made me very interested in entrepreneurship. I found out that's the best way to breach the gap between academia and industry is to become an entrepreneur. And given my background and my PhD, I was one of the people who could bring the computer vision and AI technologies that I was developing during my research to the market and to patients' lives. And then when I finished my PhD studies, I had my first son and he developed a head deformity condition. And that became the main motivation to build the cranial scanning product for infants. And given my background and my network at Children's National, I founded Pediametrics so that I can help other parents not to have to go through the same thing that I experienced, having to go through multiple specialists, the wait times and the anxiety during the time that we were figuring out what needed to be done for my son. So you wanted to do a startup, you wanted to fix the medical issues that your son had. You had a computer imaging background, but was that enough to get you started or did you bring in more team members? I think the team is very important and I met my team mainly in the Children's National Hospital. I actually approached my former advisor there who had worked in the area of research for detecting skull deformities in infants using machine learning and computer vision. So first, I talked with him because if we wanted to use any computer vision technologies for diagnosing a condition, we had to train it with patient data. And then when I talked with him about the idea, he was very interested in joining as a co-founder, so he became one of the co-founders. And then we later on added other co-founders who had the same mission and with the same mindset and technology background that we needed. So we just had this talk, too, in the cohort, but it seems like mission is the key there, right? I think that's so powerful. You went to your a former advisor, asking him for help around the problem you're trying to solve. You really loved the mission and decided to join, and it just kept going from there, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Aligning your team with the mission. Even now, whenever I onboard a new team member and new hire, I always make sure to mention the mission of the Pediometrics team because I think even for employees as well, and more importantly for co-founders, you really want to make sure that you're aligned with the mission of the company. All right, so going into the burning questions that startups have around getting grants. Let's talk grants. I guess just to set the stage for this, if I was a startup, kind of like where you were in the early stages, I have a problem that I'm trying to solve. I have do domain expertise, and what I'm building is deep tech or difficult potentially, high risk, or just technically challenging. I think I'm a good recipient for a grant. Where do I start? So for SBR grants, the company needs to have been registered already and usually before your first submission, there are five registrations that the company needs to do in five different systems, government systems, and all of them should be approved. And specifically, I think the SAM takes a lot of time. So make sure before the submission, three or four months beforehand, you have registered the company and start registering in the government systems. You need to look at different programs that are available in each federal agency that have SBIR programs and then see which one aligns best with the product that you are building. 
And every year they post their programs and their goals and different SBIR tracks that they have online. So you need to go check them. I'm specifically very familiar with how NIH and NSF post these goals. And for both NIH and NSF, you need to contact a program officer that is running the department that is closest to the product that you are building. And then once you contact them, they will guide you through the process. Usually you need to send them an executive summary, a summary of the product you are building, or sometimes your specific aims for the grant. And then they will tell you if they think that it is aligned with their programs or they refer you to other program officers that they think are more aligned. And then from there, you can start the application process. So thanks for that. Yeah, I think that's really insightful to go and reach out to the program officers and they can actually help you through the process as well. You talked a little bit about aims. Is that just like in general your goals or is that something specific that they really should have included in the proposal? Yeah, for NIH, a specific aims is a one pager that you write. It has a specific format and it's part of the application also, but it usually it is the first one page you prepare for your proposal to align your team and also to be able to communicate the aims that you are planning to achieve with the grant with the program officer. So you send that to the program officer at NIH, usually along with your executive summary that describes your team, company, and business, a little bit of business plans. And then from there, they can assess if it is aligned with the goals of their program or if they want you to reach out to other programs at NIH. NSF also has a similar process. I think they don't call the document specific aims, but it's a similar document. If you go online on NSF seed funds, they have it listed there with a template. Perfect. So a startup should go to the SBIR sites, the agency sites, look through the grants and then decide if they feel like this agency might be the right one to submit an SBIR for and then reach out to the program officer before that, have your executive summary and download the paper to submit your either your your aims or grant proposal yes. and run yeah. that through the program officer via an email first. Exactly, yeah, via email. Usually the emails of all program officers are available online, so you can reach out to them. Give them a call. Usually they are very responsive over phone, too. It's really great to hear. Taking that first step, you just got to reach out and have yeah. a relationship. And don't be afraid to ask for their help because that's what they're there for. Yes. I remember the first call I got from one of the program officers at NIH, and she gave me a call. So I, I emailed her, and I had my phone number under the email, and she gave me a call. All of a sudden, <laughs> receiving a call from a program officer at NIH, and I had just started the company, I had just registered the company. And she told me that this has been one of the goals of our programs for a couple of years, and I'm happy that you reached out to me because we were looking for solutions that are going to address this need. So it was very exciting to hear that from her. What are some assumptions that you had that were quickly proven wrong? Okay. There are a lot of things. So for the SBIR grant, what I didn't know was that the program officers are so accessible and they are very helpful. I didn't know that it's so important to be in contact with them continuously. And you can always ask them questions. You can always ask them for help. What you can do to make your application successful. Even after your first submission, you usually get reviews. You, usually you don't get it in the first submission. So then the program officer can help you understand the feedback of the reviewers and they can tell you whether you can submit right away or is it better you do a new submission or you defend your previous submission and respond to the reviewers. So they can be very helpful in the process. Another mistake I made was that I thought I'm going to be able to secure the grant in the first submission. So I spent a lot of time in the first submission but then I was disappointed to see that we didn't get it. But it took a couple of submissions for both the agencies to get it, to get the process. So I recommend that if you are planning, start as soon as you can. Submit the version you have, and then the feedback is going to help you a lot in revising it and getting the success the next time around that you apply. So that's it for the startup. I think the fundraising has been a difficult part of it. 
And I think what we didn't realize was how important it was to reach out to many investors. And we thought that if we talk with 10 investors, then maybe one or two are going to invest and we are going to secure the funding. But as we talked with other entrepreneurs who were successful in fundraising, we realized how many investors they reached out, how much time they spent. And they reach out to maybe like they pitch to 10 investors a day. They reach out to thousands of investors to be able to secure just the pitch meetings and then go through the process. So it's, I think for the fundraising, it's more about trying to find the match, trying to find the investor that is the match to your company and to your team. It's really great to, I think, reiterate that it's just a numbers game. Yes. But also take the feedback with each iteration too. Exactly, yeah. Every round that you pitch and it's not successful, you're going to grow. You're going to make this better. And it also was the same for grants. So every time that we submitted and we didn't get it, the whole company grew because we were applying the feedback that we were receiving and we were brainstorming. How do we resolve this? It's something that's important they are pointing to. How do we pivot a little? Not a major pivot necessarily, but how do we pivot? How do we redesign our business model to address these concerns? So business model is also really important in the grant proposal, not just the technology. Yes, yes, definitely. On a percentage scale, what do you think it is? For NSF, you, I think you have 15 pages and half of it is about the business side of things. And then half of it is about the technical and the aims of the technical proposal. I think in addition to the technical aspects of it, they really value the letters. So you're going to have support letters and you're going to have support letters from investors, from potential customers, from potential partners. And these are very important in the SBIR grant applications. For NIH, the technology and the need is very important. The need needs to be very significant, needs to have a very high impact in addition to be highly technical, especially for phase one of NIH, you only have six pages and usually you just have half a page or even less for, to talk about the business model. So for phase one NIH, it's more about need, justifying the need, the significance of it, and then talking about how you think you can solve it and then a little bit about business model. But in phase two, you will have to submit a business model, 12-page separate documents for the business model. Would you say that the need correlates to the problem that you're solving in the world? It is the need of, of the market. For example, if you're applying to, let's say, the Children's Institute at NIH, what kind of the need of the patient population you're addressing and how significant is that need? Like how many children are being affected with it? What is the cost to the healthcare industry and why is it not solved now? And how you think your new innovation is going to solve this unmet need? Basically, six pages of proving that there's a real need, the problem exists, and that it's not being solved, at least not to the extent that you have the potential to solve it. Both NIH and NSF reviewers evaluate you on five different areas. And the most important one, the first one they evaluate you is the significance, which is what is the significance of the need that you're addressing. Reverse of that is what's the impact it could have if yes. you were successful. Yes. And in both of them, you need to also justify the bigger impact. So if your technology that you are developing for some reason will not solve that specific need, how can you then translate that technology to make it a bigger impact in other areas? So that's phase one of the submission, and we said it took you three iterations to get phase one. And were you submitting for both agencies, or were you submitting for one? We were submitting for both at the same time, but we, we got successful with the second try in NSF, but by that time we had done three or four total. But did you end up getting grants from both agencies, or was it from one that you got phase one? The thing is you cannot have overlapping applications or same applications accepted in both agencies. So we were applying for the same thing for phase one, until we secured the NSF. And then from that point, we just focused on NSF. We did not have any applications to NIH. 
And then when we were applying for phase two of NSF, we came up with a new idea, a next generation. So our NSF grant is covering the product that's in the market, our soft spot 2D. But then the NIH was an idea that came up while we were working on our soft spot 2D. There were some needs that we identified as we were talking with the customers. And then we had uh, some feasibility studies supported by the NSF grant that enabled us to submit a new proposal for NIH fast track. And fast track means it's a combination of phase one and phase two. It's for when you are a little later stage than a phase one, but you are still not there yet for a phase two. So you do a fast track. And we applied for a fast track for our second generation, which is soft spot 3D. At the same time, we were working on our phase two of NSF. So you found a different problem that you wanted to solve that the line with the agency goes better, so you submitted for that and you ended up getting Exactly. Yeah. That's why I think the relationship with the program officers needs to be in place earlier because you are going to understand the goals of the agency and the program. And then once you find an idea that you see is aligned, then it's all done. Then you make the connection and you apply and then... That's how it happened. For our NIH grant, really the significance of the problem was very important. Sometimes stars will be like, can you introduce me to a grant writer who can write the grant for me? And that's what they come in thinking that, okay, I have an idea or this thing, and I think I can hire a grant writer in, and then poof, magical money will show up. Is that route possible, or how did that work out for you? What was actually writing the grant like? Yeah. No, it's not possible because there are a lot of different components to a grant. You you might outsource revising your technical proposal, but there are other components. You need to have built relationships. Nobody will give you a support letter for a partnership if you have not put that relationship in place. And then investors, you need to talk with investors actively. And then your customers, you need to be talking with them actively. And this only can be done by the founder or the main team. Then the technical side of it, you need to determine the specific aims of the grant and how that aligns with the agency program and how it helps you build your product is also something that you need to determine. Nobody can determine for you. But once you have the idea, you can get help from grant advisors. We actually worked with a grant advisor and they helped us a lot making sure that we are on time in planning how do I register for different government systems in the initial days? And then what are different agencies I need to consider? How to communicate with them? They helped me a lot with that. And then they provided me with template for all the materials that I needed to put together. And there are like 10 different components that you need to put together. And each of them needs their own template. If you are having human subject studies for NIH, for example, there are multiple components to it the IRB, and all of that needs to be figured out. And that's when the value of a grant advisor comes in because they have a lot of experience writing grants. They can help you a lot with figuring out the process, what is needed, what's the templates you can use. And then once you fill out the template, they can help you revise it, reword it. And we have also science writers, so grant advisors, some of them also do science writing. Some of them you can hire a science writer separately. And the science writers help you to make what you want to say more understandable, easier to understand. Because obviously reviewers are reviewing maybe 50, 100 applications at the same time. And they all meet for one day to just review lots of applications. After they review offline, they meet in a specific day at a specific time to discuss a lot of applications. And that's the day that they score the applications. So if you can make your proposal easy to understand, if you can convey your message better and it's an art, then you'll have a much better chance. If your idea is good, if your significance of the problem you're solving is good, then it's all about communicating your message to the reviewers in the best efficient way. And that's how the advisors can help. So for us, the three co-founders, every time we want to write a grant, we create a big project, like 10 different components, one person is gonna lead. Maybe I'm leading five of it, the other team member is leaving two of it, and the other one is leading three of it. And then we have subtasks for each part. For example, for the human subject I study, there are five different materials, documents that need to be prepared. And then we know that each person is good at which one. 
So we assign the tasks to you know, different people in the team and also our employees and our contractors. We assign to different people, but there is one person who is leading and making sure that these materials are in place. But at the end of the day, the person who is responsible is the PI, the principal investigator. You can have one or two PIs. So for some of the grants, I am the PI. So I had to, at the end of the day, put everything together and push the submit button, and I was responsible for the content. So it is not possible to fully outsource the grant writing, just paying a grant advisor. There are so many things that goes into it that cannot be done by an um, external person. So there, there are teams that help you with the parts. But again, in every step of the way, they are going to ask you how to do it. They are going to ask you to provide the materials. It is a product in and of itself, right? And it's like the whole team that has to work together. And I think to your point, you don't want somebody probably to write your grant for you anyways, even if it was possible and they could do a good job because you, you're going to have to execute on that for the next yes. three years and you have no idea. If you have yeah. no idea what they wrote, you have no idea what you have to right. do. It's like ridiculous. Right? It's your business. You're putting everything that you're going to do into that grant. So it has to come from you and your team. So just to summarize a little bit of what you said, you can bring in like a grant advisor that they can give you the structure because they've done it many times before. They can provide templates, they can provide guidance, but they won't tell you what exactly to put inside. They can maybe tell you whether it's a good idea or or not, or help you revise it, or help you order the sequence of things and things like that. And you basically bring on your whole team, you guys divvy up the tasks in accordance to proficiency within your teams, and you work on it, but there is a lead person, the principal investigator, that really is in charge of making it all cohesive and putting it all together. And then you can outsource different parts of it, especially for um, the technical parts. You can bring in experts for that. And then reversely, when you guys are the technical people, you bring in people to make your technical wording more impactful in context of reviewers reading it. It's a team sport and it's just a huge project and you can bring in outside people to both do tactical work but also provide structure. Ultimately, your team is what has to yes. produce it. Yes. Amazing. We have startups participating nationally, right, all over the U.S., but where would they go and find a good a grant writer, or sorry, grant advisor? For us, we found it through our network. So our grant advisor we work with, we found it through a Tesco by Maryland. I think he's still available. I can make introduction. I myself can do. I have done grant advisorship for a couple of startups. Also, we got a referral from my advisor at Children's National. She was really efficient, making the science of it more understandable and more exciting to read. Um, so I think it was mostly for us through referral. I know there are other programs, for example, TEDCO in Maryland has a program for SBIR advisorship. Also, there is the Biohealth Innovation in Rockville in Maryland. Also, the agencies themselves. I think MIH also has a grant guiding program that they provide to applicants for free. Almost on every state, they do have SBIR support organizations. I think you could just do a Google search for it too. Yeah, if you search for NIH SBIR advisorship or a guidance program, you will find some programs by the NIH. And then for us, the, we also got a grant from Biohealth Innovation at the time. I'm not sure if they still have that grant. They paid for the advisorship cost, but then once we secured the grant, we paid it back from the fees. In every grant, you get about 7 to 10 percent fees that you can spend on anything related to company costs and even debt. And that is fees that you could just use that doesn't have to go towards executing the grant? Yes, when you get the grant, there are three main components. One is direct cost, one is indirect cost, and one is fee. Direct cost, you can do budget revisions most of the time afterwards, but you always have to communicate it with the program officer. The direct costs have to be research and um, early development that has been approved by the reviewers. And then you have indirect costs, which is a cost that you cannot attribute to a specific project, but each project has its own indirect costs. Like there, there are administrative things, there are um, taxes, there are benefits to the employees, things like that. So that's going to be our indirect cost. And then the fee is something that they don't ask you about how you spent it. It just needs to be spent on business, 
but for direct and indirect, they will ask you how you spent it, and you need to be able to justify. Got it. All right. Thank you so much. Super insightful. What's next for the metrics? We are raising $3 million. So far, most of our funding has been from grants to be able to build a commercialization and product team and then scale up on our commercialization. $3 million seed round, and then you're going to scale up your, your sales, basically. Yes. Thank you so much for this interview and also for mentoring in our program. And yeah, look forward to next things. You're welcome. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be more, ha more than happy to help with the questions regarding grants, startups, anything.